Welcome here this morning. So glad that we could be together, even if that means being together virtually. It's been quite the week. So hopefully this will be an encouraging time to be together and still worship our Lord and our Savior together. But before we begin and uh, listen to uh, the Word of God, let's um, start with prayer. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll lead you in prayer, uh, a time where we can reflect, a time where we can be uh, led in different avenues um, as we come together. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that we could be together in these circumstances, and we ask that you would continue to do a mighty work among us. Even as we are separate from one another, we know that we are the church and that we're the body of Christ. So Lord, we come and we just ask that even as we pray together, uh, that we would be a sweet smell to you, Lord, that we would be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children. So I'm just going to ask that you take a moment to um, adore the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our heads and adore the Trinity. Let's transition into confession. And confession is, yeah, sometimes we have to confess things that are between us and God and other times between us and other people. But confession is also, I confess, Lord, that I need you. I confess, Lord, that I'm so thankful for your mercy. We confess, Lord, that you're Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Let's do that. Let's give him thanks. And finally, let's bring our requests to God, our supplications. Heavenly Father, thank you once again that we get to be together. And we do pray in this day and age that you would continue to show your power. I pray that you would instill wisdom and discernment and timing when it comes to our leaders, when it comes to Trudeau and the cabinet, when it comes to Horgan here in our province. And Heavenly Father, we know at the end of the day that you're sovereign and you care for us. We know from the psalmist that he says, even though we walk through any kind of valley, the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for you are with us, your rod and your staff, they comfort us. We also know, Lord, from Proverbs that you say that we need to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own understandings. In all of our ways, acknowledge you and you will direct our paths. So, Lord, we come together and we're just thankful that we get to be together in some way today and we worship you. Precious blood of Christ. 
Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. Your blood. Your blood. Your robe of righteousness. Your blood. My hope and my defense. Your blood. Forever covers me. Forever covers me. It's singing now with lies. It's shouting now the lies. It echoes through the night. The precious blood of Christ speaks a better word. Speaks a better word. It's calling. It's calling. blood of Christ speaks a better word, speaks a better word. Welcome here again this morning. This morning, it's good to be together. As you can see, I've went through my whole closet and I picked out this shirt because I think it's time that we have a, a little picture of spring. In fact, if you do get out and go for a walk, be that uh, with a neighbor or whatever, you keeping your social distance, you'll notice that there's all sorts of veg vegetation sprouting up, along with the trees are budding. So it's just a fantastic time to notice and pay attention to what God is doing. Speaking of spring, I got to admit that I was brought back, transported back to when I was a kiddo, and I had this horrible job of having to help my mom plant and harvest the garden. 
I swear we had the biggest garden in the whole world. The whole world. Uh, it was ginormous, and perhaps that's because we had nine kids, or mom had nine kids, I don't know. But on one side, there was a whole bunch of trees that my dad had planted, and right beside them were gooseberry bushes. Who even liked gooseberries? Really? And then she would make one of the boys grab this kind of harrowing instrument, had three prongs on it, and like a donkey, we'd have to pull this thing so we would make perfect lines. And then when the lines were made, then we'd have to dig in, and then we could put in the seed or, or put in the spud or whatever it might be and cover it up again. And then we were finally free from our slavery for a while. And then come harvest, or actually before harvest, we'd even have to weed or, or um, hoe the weeds. And then harvest came and we'd have to shell peas or we'd have to dig up the potatoes. And I just remember, oh, if my brothers were busy or away and it was just me and my mom, it was just horrible. So it was always awesome to have more hands on deck. The more, the merrier, shall we say. Well, we've actually come into our study in the book of Luke to the place where you guessed it, we're talking about the harvest. So we've gone all the way, if you can believe it, from Luke chapter 1 now to Luke chapter 10, and today he's talking about sending out the workers and paying attention to the harvest, for the harvest is great, the harvest is ripe, it's white, and it's time to do it. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, and I don't usually do this, but today I'm actually going to be reading a big portion of scripture from the message. I thought the message did a good job of making it very clear. And like Josiah was saying, Pastor Josiah, he said, I could go so many ways with this passage because it's so long, but hopefully we'll bring it all together and realize the main points of it together. So Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 1. Later, the master selected 70 and sent them ahead of him in Paris to every town and place where he intended to go. I got to pause there already because you might be in a different version that says uh, he sent out 72. And it really doesn't matter. 70, 72, it's one of those things that you don't want to get caught up on. But we're talking about 70 were sent out in pairs. That's the big deal you need to get from this passage. He gave them this charge. What a huge harvest, he says. And how few the harvest hands or the harvesters So on your knees, he says, ask the God of the harvest to send harvest hands. On your way, exclamation mark. But be careful, because this is hazardous work. You're like lambs in a wolf pack. So travel light, comb and toothbrush, and no extra luggage. Don't loiter and make small talk with everyone you meet along the way. So he's not saying here, don't be kind to others or pay attention to others, but what he's really trying to say here is that we have a job to do, and it's urgent. That's what you're feeling here. When you enter a home, greet the family. Peace. If your greeting is received, then it's a good place to stay. But if it's not received, take it back and get out. Don't impose yourself. Stay at one home, taking your meals there. For a worker deserves three square meals. Don't move from house to house looking for the best cook in town. When you enter a town and are received, eat what they set before you. Heal anyone who is sick and tell them God's kingdom is right on your doorstep. When you enter a town and are not received, go out in the street and say, the only thing we got from you is the dirt on our feet and we're giving it back. I like how it says that. Did you have... Any idea that God's kingdom was right on your doorstep? Did you get that? Let's read that again. Did you have any idea that God's kingdom was right on your doorstep? What a fantastic way to approach life, don't you think? God's kingdom is right here on our doorstep right now. Sodom will have have it better on judgment day than the town that rejects you. And if you don't know much about Sodom, there you go. Now you know what you're going to do this week. Go read up on Sodom. Doom, Chorazin, Doom, Bethsaida. If Tyre and Sidon had been given half the chances given you, they'd have been on their knees long ago, repenting and crying for mercy. Tyre and Sidon will have it easy on Judgment Day. 
compared to you. So really, he's bringing us back to the Old Testament and saying, you remember them. But I tell you, you've actually given the truth, and you're actually rejecting it. And there's consequences to it. Verse 15, and you, Capernaum, do you think you're about to be promoted to heaven? Think again. You're on a mudslide to hell. And right, a commentator at this point would add that they actually experienced a stern judgment in their day by the hands of the Romans. Verse 16, the one who listens to you listens to me. The one who rejects you rejects me. And rejecting me is the same as rejecting God who sent me. The 70 came back triumphant. Master, even the demons danced to your tune. Jesus said, I know. I saw Satan fall, a bolt of lightning out of the sky. See what I've given you? Safe passage as you walk on snakes and scorpions and protection from every assault of the enemy. We better pause there because probably don't try this at home. But hopefully we'll talk in just a bit what that might mean. No one can put a hand on you. All the same, the great triumph is not in your authority over evil, but in God's authority over you. God's authority over you and his presence with you. Let that sink in for a second. God's authority over you and his presence. In this time right now, what's dominated by fear and the news, you hardly want to turn it on because it's more bad news. But here he is promising his authority over us and his presence. Not what you do for God, but what God does for you. That's the agenda worth rejoicing. May God bless the reading of his word. So going back to what I kind of promised in just a bit. In verse 18 to 20, we can see that uh, this passage that uh, you don't want to take all that literally, that we can walk on snakes and scorpions and protection from every assault. Really what he's saying is these are um, symbols of the evil one and some of the dangers that we um, might bump into. And he's saying that his presence and his authority is there with us. So we don't go out looking for trouble, but because we share the good news in a dark world, we will bump into trouble And he promises his authority, and he promises his presence. So it's kind of interesting when we look at this passage, because it should remind us of just a while back, we talked about the sending out of the 12. So here we have the 70 or the 72, and not that long ago, we actually talked about sending out of the 12. Again, this is a descriptive passage, so you can't grab everything from this passage and now plunk it into your life thinking you can do exactly everything that it said here. But there's some incredible action steps here that I think we can actually apply to our own lives even today. So I kind of want to approach it like John the Baptist, you know, like he was said, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And when I look at this, I kind of see the same thing. He's helping us roll this out. How can we be a part of preparing the way of the Lord? And I think there's at least four things that we can do or four things that we can apply in order to kind of put this passage in action for us today. And here's the first one. He says, look around and see the harvest. Look around and see the harvest. If you have any farming background, and lo and behold, you have two pastors that are from farming communities. If anybody notices the harvest, we absolutely do. And you do notice it when it's time to harvest. And a farmer is always paying attention to the weather The farmer's always paying attention to what it's like outside, his crop, when things need to be sprayed, when it's time to back off and let it grow, when it's time to weed, whatever it might be. But a farmer pays attention to his crop and a farmer pays attention to the time. He pays attention to his machinery. He's got to be ready to go when it's time to harvest. And here, Jesus is sending out these workers He's sending out these 70 to prepare the way for the Savior, for the Messiah, for Jesus Christ. He's really saying that a farmer needs to know when it's time to reap, when it's time to weed, 
when it's time to harvest and the best time to sow. You got to be ready. You got to be ready. And be ready to deal with the harvest quickly. I've talked to you before about uh, one of the guys that was right at the bottom or right at the beginning of starting Miller College of the Bible. So Herbert Peeler would often say something like this. He says, you got to be ready to preach, pray, or die at a moment's notice. And that's kind of what we're talking about with the harvest. You got to be ready to move. You got to be ready to share your faith. You got to be ready to share your life. You got to be ready to share what God has done in your life. So be always ready to share the hope that you have within you. My friends, even though these times are very tempting to be full of fear, and I think we all face fear, let's be honest, but yet we have been given a glimpse into the future and we've also been given a glimpse right here that he promises authority to us and he promises his presence. So no matter the fear that you're experiencing or the loneliness you're experiencing right now or the question marks about our future, the fact is, you guys, that we can still re- respond to our neighbors graciously and politely and with joy, with gratitude and exuberance, not because we're not facing fears, but because we're pressing in to what Christ has for us. You see, we got a hope. We got a promise. We know the end result, and here we have an awesome opportunity to continue to care for people, be that via email, via broadcast on the internet, or a simple phone call, but let's continue to stay in contact with each other. Be always ready to share the hope within you. So right now, you guys, and I mean right now, there is this opportunity of harvest. Did you know there's a lot of folks that seem to be putting their hope in hand sanitizer and toilet paper, as you can see on the news these days? But the fact is, even though we have to be prepared and you got to be paying attention to social distancing and cleanliness and all that, yet that's not where our hope is. Our hope is in the Lord and we have a message right now to share with folks by how we act, how we embrace people, and how we respond with hope in this journey. I kind of believe that Jesus sees uh, a bunch of people that are being led astray or sheep without a shepherd. Perhaps folks that have grown up knowing only religion and only motivated Uh, by transactions and consequences of that. So they have this deep, steeped religion, but no connection with God, no connection that Jesus loves them, no connection that maybe the Spirit of God can actually convict them and guide them and give them a sense that they're loved by the Trinity. Others have been sucked into different religions or different philosophies, and sometimes they might look condescendingly down on Christianity. I'm not sure. Others have, are lacking purpose and love, and Jesus' heart breaks over this. My friends, the harvest is ripe. It was back here in Luke chapter 10, and the same thing is true today. There's so many people that need to see the good news in action. They need hope in a time that seems hopeless. Folks, we got to look around we got to pay attention, like a farmer, to the times, and we got to pay attention to the crop, to the people that need to hear it. Secondly, it's interesting that he actually says, pray for more harvesters. And this is kind of cool because he's telling the harvesters to pray for more harvesters. So he's not getting some harvesters to go out, and he's getting some other people to sit down in a pew saying, now you guys pray and you guys work. He's actually going to the workers and saying, as you're working, pray for more harvesters. So it would be fantastic if we could sit safely within a pew and tell everybody else to go do the work, but he's actually trying to mobilize all of us because, again, all of us are in community. All of us have friendships. All of us have families, and we're mobilized to share the good news. 
So really, it comes back to what we've been preaching about for months now. Disciples make disciples make disciples make disciples. Here's a shameless plug for microgroups. Within microgroups, which is really describing a, a group of maybe three to seven people about there, and why they're so small is so that nobody can hide, and there's an accountability, everybody's opinion matters, and there's this discipleship that happens as you grow together in Christ. And what I like about it, there's an accountability built in. You kind of got to show up and do your homework because it's pretty hard to hide if there's only three of you. There's a transformation that can happen. I know that within my own life, a lot of the beautiful times that have happened for me has been in a really small group, a group of friends or a group of people that are all on the same page moving toward Christ together. Transformation. And a priesthood of all believers. Isn't it more true now than ever that you guys need to trust that Jesus has given you the tools to understand his word. He's given you the tools to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. He's given you the tools to open up his word and be led by his word. The priesthood of all believers. So how important is it that we actually believe and we trust that we can look in the Bible together and be led and discover things together? It's really important. He tells these 70 leaders to pray for more harvesters because the harvest is so great. There's no spectators here hoping that someone else will do it. Harvesting's hard work. Like I said when I was a kiddo, it wasn't my favorite, and it was hard work. I'd much rather be doing something important like playing with my little Hot Wheels or my Lego, whatever it might be. But no, I was conscripted to do the hard work of harvesting. And it is hard work here. He's really, in essence, saying all hands on deck. If you have a relationship with Christ, you got to be a part of the harvest. You're a harvester. You're a harvester. We all got to get our hands dirty. And when it comes to praying for more harvesters, um, one of the things that I'd even like you to consider if you're still struggling with kind of a rhythm in your prayer time is one that I think is pretty cool, and you may have noticed that I started the service with it. It may help you to focus if you do something like um, Acts. That's not, uh, it didn't start with me, but Acts is kind of cool, is you look at your prayer time uh, with adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and then supplication. So just like we did at the beginning of the service, you just start at the cross. And don't go off on your fears and I'm praying for all sorts of stuff, but you actually center your thoughts. You meditate on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Take your eyes off of your fears, off of your anxieties, off of some of the things that you perceive as needs or wants, and actually focus them on what Christ has done for you. Adore him. Spend some time there. And then we went to confession. And confession, like I said before, is sometimes confessing, Lord, I am so grateful, and I confess that I need your grace and your mercy. I confess that you have been my provider for so many years. We confess that you're the uh, Jehovah Jireh. We confess that you are the power that made the mountains as we look up to the mountains. You can go on, and other times you can confess, Lord, I've been struggling with fear. Lord, I've been struggling with not trusting you. What a beautiful time, because you've just adored him, and now you're being real honest. And then you move to gratitude or tea, thanksgiving. And you are thankful for the things around you, his faithfulness, the friends, church, whatever it might be. But I think part of the characteristics of a Christian or a disciple is learning to have gratitude, learning to have thanks, no matter the circumstance. And finally, S is supplication. A great scrabble word for you. But supplication really is praying to God and finally giving your heartfelt needs, interceding for people, and even interceding for yourself, whatever that might be. So acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. What a great way to pray for more harvesters. Thirdly, we see that he's really telling us, and I love how Eugene Peterson puts it, he says, on your way, 
Like, get on with it, exclamation mark. And that's what he's saying. He says, get moving and be part of the harvest. Get moving and be part of the harvest. There is a definite urgency in this passage along with a warning. So really what he's saying is you are ambassadors. I've given you the power and I've given you the job to do. And now get moving. Some of us have great excuses, but throughout Scripture you're going to see all sorts of excuses even in the Old Testament and God would meet with them and say, that's okay if you're not a great speaker. I'll touch your lips. It's okay if you're not sure. I will actually work through you. You will be my spokesperson. So the same thing is true today. He's given us sonship, or you're his daughter, he's given you authority, he's given you a job to do, and he's given us his spirit that is available 24-7, my friends. 24-7. Get moving, you are his ambassador. And by ambassador, just quickly what I mean is, you have been given power and authority. So not only that, he's also given you a message or a job to do. And you can go now, understanding that his presence and his authority is with you. This really has been a reminder of the disciples being sent out in power, but it's also a foreshadowing that we too are sent out as witnesses. We know that from Acts chapter 1 verse 8, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. You know, when I was thinking about that, To be a witness really means that you've spent time with Christ. You've witnessed Christ. You've witnessed God the Father. You've witnessed the Spirit. You've seen them in action. In order for that to happen, you've got to spend time noticing the Godhead in action to be a witness of it. You can't witness if you haven't seen Jesus or God, or the Holy Spirit in action. So first off, we've got to pay attention and witness what they're doing, what they're up to. But secondly, I would say, you can't witness if you don't hang out with other homo sapiens. We are in relationship with the Trinity, but we're also in relationship with people. And it's amazing to me, and I've said it before, that, I, boy, if I was God, I'm not sure if I would have chosen people to carry my good news because we're pretty good at messing it up and sometimes misrepresenting it or we're moody and all that stuff. But here he actually gives us sonship so we belong. He gives us authority and then he gives us the message and he empowers that message. It's incredible stuff, you guys. So First of all, we witness what Christ is doing. We spend some time with him. We meditate. We press into him. But then we also spend time with others. And right now, that means online or going outside together in small groups. I'm not sure what it is. But the fact is, we've got to somehow proclaim to others what we have witnessed Christ do. And so often, I say it again, that Christ's story is in your story, or your story is in Christ. So God has done marvelous things in your life. Are you sharing that with others? It's not just for you. So get moving and be a part of the harvest. You're his ambassadors. So looking back, it says, look around and see the harvest. So notice people and notice the times. Secondly, pray for more harvesters, and you are a harvester praying for more harvesters. Thirdly, Get moving and be a part of it or be an ambassador. And then lastly, which I think is terribly important, is you got to hone the art of listening. You got to learn to listen to God and learn to listen to others. The art of listening. He says in the latter verses, don't just rejoice that folks receive Jesus or that you can cast out demons or that you've seen some powerful stuff, but be thankful that your name is written in the book of life. Pastor Josiah pointed that out a couple weeks ago, is that we can kind of get sidetracked by all the cool things of being a part of the kingdom of God and seeing authority and all that stuff. But the fact is, going back to even our prayer outline, we adore. So one of the things we can adore the Godhead for is that I'm a son of the Most High King. This is incredible. It's absolutely incredible. 
So don't just rejoice that folks receive Jesus and he powerfully works in and through you, but be thankful that your name is written in the book of life, God's book of life. My friends, we're good. God has this. He knows what you're going through. He knows your loneliness. If you're struggling with anxiety, and this is where I'd really like to pause for a second, is all of us deal with this. I don't mat- it doesn't matter how old or how long you've been a Christian, but so often we have to fight our anxieties, our unknowns of the future, by pressing in to Jesus moment by moment. So I'm not just saying 10 minutes at the beginning of the day. I'm saying being reminded, and sometimes I've even had a phone, uh, sorry, a, uh, a watch that goes off every hour. And when I hear that a little alarm every hour, it reminds me to talk to Jesus and center my thoughts, center my strength, center my emotions, center my spirit, and pressing in to Jesus and him alone. Doesn't that sound like a good thing to do in this time, in this harvest time, when we see the uncertainty of the coronavirus all around us? That should give you confidence that you are his and that he gives you authority, that he gives you presence, and he cares for what you're going through right now. And my friends, the world is going through this, and we carry the torch of hope, the torch of presence, the torch of authority, the torch of the harvest as harvesters. And I just want to encourage you to continue to press into Jesus, continue to realize that we get to also proclaim this incredible good news because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. All hands on deck. So at the end of the day, Our passage is really about noticing that God is mighty and that he is showing up in might, he's showing up in power, and he's showing up in presence through Jesus Christ. And we are his ambassadors. If we have something worth listening to, we had better be leaning in first and then listening to the Savior. And then we turn to our neighbor and start to listen to some of the things that are heavy on them. And because we've been listened to by our Savior and we're starting to get good at listening to him, we can also listen to our neighbors and hopefully connect them in a relationship with Jesus Christ because the harvest is ripe. When we learn to listen to God and understand that he listens to us, That'll make us better listeners to the folks that God puts in our path. So let's look for the signs of the harvest and let's roll up our sleeves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this passage and I thank you for how powerful it is that you're still in the business of sending harvesters because the harvest is ripe. And Lord, right now, there's lots of people scratching their head and and they have a lot of anxiety and they're hopeless. And we would just ask, Lord, that you help us to be creative and somehow reaching people with the good news. Help us to reach them with the gratitude and with the hope, with the promise of tomorrow, Lord Jesus. So help us to pay attention, help us to listen, and help us to be led to people that we can share the hope that's within us, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to leave you with this blessing. Go and be his witnesses because you will receive power and hope and a steadfast mind. Perfect love casts out fear. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope, no place to be in. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, 
my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan art was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested, my is over me you have made me new now life begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made
if you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness of God I will see of the goodness of God I will see goodness of See your face, see your 
Lift up. 